Hello, folks. This is Joseph Palmer, the autodidact. And uh, you're here because you want to learn Blender. This tutorial is for complete beginners to Blender. Um, you also don't necessarily need to have worked with uh, computer animation or computer graphics before. I'm going to walk you through the uh, basic steps for downloading, installing Blender, and configuring it. It's not difficult, but there are a few configuration things that um, if you don't know about ahead of time, um, well, I'm going to save you some time by walking you through uh, the basic setup. And then I'm going to take you through a basic demonstration of some of uh, Blender's more important features. By the time this uh, tutorial is over, you'll be ray, ray tracing an animated scene. So let's get to it. So let's go in here and let's run Blender. If we open up the folder, you'll see a lot of files in here that you don't need to worry about. Um, there are two executables, blender.exe and blender-launcher.exe. You want to run this one. And let's open it right now. The first time you run Blender, um, if you don't have an existing configuration, It'll run this this splash screen right here, which asks you some basic questions like your language and uh, what shortcuts you want to use, what what th theme you want to use. Um, I think this is mostly for for people that have used earlier versions of Blender. You should be okay to use the defaults here. Um, I like the Blender Dark theme, so if you prefer something lighter, you can check out the, all the different themes they have in here. Um, note that you can also change these themes later. You don't need to do it right now. So, but this splash screen will only open the first time you run Blender. So we'll hit next. This splash screen though opens every time you run Blender. This is a uh, convenient help menu for different configurations depending on what you want to do with Blender. Um, there's also links to documentation. Um, and I visit these websites regularly, so I recommend them. We want to go to the uh, general file. This is usually one you want to do unless uh, you have something more specific you need to do. Um, like if you want to do drawing, some sort of drawing, artwork, 2D animation, you want to go to the 2D animation. Video editing, I haven't used this mode because you can do video editing also in the general. So we're going to go to general. And this is the default starter screen for the general mode, what we call the default cube. Um, before we do anything with the interface here, we need to do a few configuration things. So we're going to go into edit preferences. And for your benefit, the first thing I'm going to do, and you don't need to do what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to turn on um, screen key cast key casting so that you can see what keys I'm using. So bear with me for a second while I install this add-on. Like I said, I just downloaded this. I uh, wanted to make sure that I was giving you guys the same experience you'll see when you try to do this. Okay, and what this add-on will do is, um, as I... Uh, so Blender is has an unusual user interface in that it's very dependent on shortcuts. If uh, if you've ever used the text editor Emacs, I think of Blender as the um, computer graphics animation equivalent of Emacs. Emacs uh, is interface to, to you for Emacs to be powerful and to get the best out of it. You need to learn its many many different shortcuts. Once you learn them though, and they become muscle memory, people that are experienced Emacs users, if you've ever watched them, are incredibly fast and efficient at executing tasks, and especially in computer programming. Something equivalent happens in Blender. It has many, many shortcuts, and um, it'll look overwhelming at first, and some of them will seem odd until you take the time to learn them. And it doesn't take as long as you might think. Once you start using these and your muscles learn to, these repetitive motions, it'll, it'll go quicker than you think, but uh, you can become very efficient. And you'll see some of that today if you see the whole whole demo. So 
Why am I explaining this to you? Well, I'm enabling screencast keys so that as I'm using shortcuts and you're watching me do things, you'll see what happens on the screen that I'm doing. And at the same time, you'll see on the screen uh, this, the the keys that I've just pressed in the sequences. And then you can go back later and watch those and, and learn how I did this, the things that I did instead of having, there'll be some mouse arrows you need to follow, but there'll also be keys. And hopefully this will help you learn the shortcuts quicker. So that's why I'm enabling this. Let me get it configured real quick. And um, this uh, is how you add add-ons into, into Blender. So we're going to, Enable screencast keys, set this to a light green color, make the font a little bigger. We're gonna align this to the right side of the screen and uh, a little bit offset because the defaults aren't very good. Increase display time, history length, and I'm gonna show mouse events, but I want them to be text history instead of it showing you the mouse buttons. Um, and then uh, the last operator used, let's make that line thickness a little. All right, that should do it. And now you can see here in the bottom right of the main screen here, when I press buttons and keys and things like that, it shows history there. And hopefully that'll help you learn things quicker. And I've gotten myself into an odd mode here. Um, all right, well, we'll figure that. There we go. I had the uh, circle select mode on instead of the box drawn. I don't want the circle select mode right now. So we have the default cube. Um, there's one other, I added, uh, configured that add-on. There's um, a couple other configuration things that you need to do. Uh, First, a uh, quick discussion. So let's go into back into edit preferences. We're gonna go down near the bottom on the left to system and cycles render devices. This is where you configure your GPU. So since I'm this is about GPUs, let's talk for a minute about hardware requirements. Do you need a GPU to run Blender? The short answer is no. Um, what if you're going to have a hardware limitation that keeps you from running blender it's not going to be a lack of a gpu though a gpu is highly advantageous especially if you plan on doing lots of ray tracing um, or and or animations but um, what's probably more important is the amount of memory on your computer um, i would recommend a minimum of eight gigabytes and uh, i use 16 gigabytes and most of the time i'm okay there's been a few times with complex scenes where i've had memory issues, but 16 gigabytes is sufficient. Eight should be enough. Less than eight may be a problem. Now, as far as GPU, um, if you have a high performance CPU on your computer, you can still do quite a bit without a GPU. Uh, I have a laptop with a, it's a high performance laptop um, with a an NVIDIA RTX 2050 GPU. So it's a GPU, but it's nothing screaming fast. It is for a laptop. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's about four to five times faster than using the CPU for doing certain types of rendering. So definitely is beneficial. Um, and it's and it can be pretty fast. So I would love to have one of those like $40,000 render rigs that have massive GPUs on them. I'm sure they can do it 10 times faster. Um, but I don't, and, and yet Blender is still extremely useful for me. So um, other hardware requirement, uh, I would say this is a soft requirement, but you're gonna have a hard time getting around in Blender without it. You wanna have a keyboard that has a number pad on it, like, like this right here, number pad, because some of the most important shortcuts uh, can only be done with a number pad. So if you have like a small laptop, See if you can get a number pad. You can buy these number pad peripherals as, a, as an add-on, but you're gonna want that, that number pad. Other than that, so memory, GPU, and number pad are really the only major hardware considerations when it comes to Blender. So now that we've talked about GPUs, cycle render device, 
it defaults to no GPU. So you need to go and set this. If you're using an NVIDIA GPU and it's a newer within, you know, the last three or four years GPU, you want to set the op to the optics option. And I enable both the, my, my GeForce RTX GPU and the CPU, just in case it wants to use the CPU. If you have an AMD GPU, it should work just fine also, but you're going to want to use the CUDA driver instead of the OptiX. I haven't used the other options, um, but you're welcome to try them if you want. Other than that, you don't need to configure anything else in here, um, in the systems menu. I am going to enable a couple other add-ons. These are, there's many add-ons included with Blender. Um, they very helpfully ship these with Blender. And some of them are actually already enabled by default also, but there's a couple that I want to um, enable for, for right now. One is called F2, which adds some even more shortcuts. And you can search for the, uh, if you know what add-on you want, you can search for them up here. And um, I want to enable uh, loop tools, which is another, has some additional features for for doing modeling. Um, and then we won't use it for this tutorial, but Node Wrangler is another that's used for setting up shaders. Um, I would recommend you enable it though, even if we're, though we're not gonna use it right now. And then um, two others that I really like, our extra objects, we won't need them for this tutorial, but I highly recommend them. And they're ship, they ship with Blender. And with that, you should be set to go if you set up things just like that. Now, the, and before we continue, let's save our file. Blender will autosave. It does occasion, it's a very stable tool, but it is open source and it occasionally will, will crash. So um, I recommend saving right at the beginning because if you have it in a save file, it will auto save about every two minutes by default. But um, if you haven't saved the file and it uh, it's not clear, it's not very obvious where it puts auto saves if you haven't saved the file yet. So let's be wise and make a save of this. Let me go into the file I'm using for this. Okay, so I'm going to, as a vehicle for sh for sh giving you an introduction into Blender, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it through demonstration by taking you through a, a basic modeling, rendering, and animation task of a of a uh, simulated dice. And, um, but to, let me, before I jump into that, let me just give you a quick overview of how to get around the, the main workspace right here. So Blender interface is not like other tools for, that you may have used for manipulating, um, graphics such as PowerPoint or Unity, um, so let me let me give you a quick uh, overview. Right now, you see in the main uh, workspace a cube. As I said, we call this a default cube. If you want to pan the workspace around, you need to hold the shift key and the middle mouse key. And you can drag the screen around. See, the thing about uh, Blender is that you're working with a three-dimensional environment here, which makes operations a lot more complicated than it does in 2D space. Um, first of all, you've got an extra dimension, but um, your rotations, anything that you rotate in 2D space, everything rotates around a single axis along the, uh, the axis through the X, X and Y axis. In 3D space, you have three possible rotation axes, X, Y, and Z. Um, and plus you have scalings and in, in three dimensions, um, and just makes uh, everything more complicated. And that's where, uh, as, as, diff as complicated as that becomes, the Blender Foundation has done an, an extraordinary job at um, creating a user interface that allows one to get around in 3D space well.
So keep that in mind as you note uh, the differences. So to, to pan around, we, um, we hold down the shift key and the middle mouse button, and that'll drag us across whatever our view perspective is. It'll drag us up and down and left to right. Um, if we want to zoom in and out, use the mouse, but mouse wheel. If we want to rotate the view, then you hold down the mouse button without the shift key. If you right click on an object, it'll bring up a context menu. The context menus helpfully also show the shortcut keys for certain commands that are very common. This is a great way if you can't remember a command, see if you can find it in the, uh, in one of the menus, context menu or up in the menus above. Um, if there's some command you wanna use and you cannot remember the shortcut and you for the life of you cannot find it in any of the menus, then uh, tab, tap the F3 key and type in your best recollection of the name of the command. Um, for instance, let's say I wanna do a shear operation, something that I don't do very often. Just start typing S H. E in right there, top of the menu, object, transform, shear. It's up in this menu right here. So, um, it, which happens to have a shortcut, control, shift, alt, S. So, um, those are the basic navigation commands. If you want to uh, operate on an object, you left click it. Just one left click. This is the camera right here i'll say a few things about the camera later on this is a light object if you want to select more than one object you draw a box around it with the left mouse button like i just did if you selected every more objects than you wanted you can deselect specific objects either by shift and single click on them or if you want to add them you can shift and single click on them or if you want to deselect multiple objects that you've selected, you can hold in the control key and draw a box around them and that'll deselect them. And, uh, and we, I could talk all day long about the user interface and we would only cover half of it. So I'm only covering the most basic. And then as I work through the uh, tutorial, I'll explain other things that I'm doing that I haven't covered to this point. So, but those are the main things. To move an object around, select it. And then um, to move it, you tap the G key. And then that it'll follow your mouse around. Uh, by default, it follows in the plane that is perpendicular to your axis of view through the screen. If you want to constrain the movement to an axis, then tap the key, tap the um, name of the uh, axis in. So, for instance, X. If I tap X right now, the uh, object's still following my mouse. If I tap X, it'll follow along the X, X, X axis. If I tap Y, it'll be the Y axis, and then Z. It'll drag along the z-axis. Um, to cancel a movement, if, if I have an object, right now I'm not touching the buttons on the mouse and the object is following my mouse key. To uh, leave it where the mouse is at, just tap the left key again, the left mouse button again. If you didn't like where it ended up, press Control z for undo. And... Um, for rotations, that was movement rotations instead of tapping. So G is for rotations. To rotate, tap R instead. So R. And then by default, that rotates in the plane along the axis of view through the viewport. But uh, just like with drag, you can use the X and the Y key. So I'm right now I'm rotating around the X axis. If I tap Y, now it's rotating along the Y axis. And then Z is rotating along that axis. Uh, another way to do this is up here at the top right, there's options for the viewport. Um, so under viewport gizmos, there are gizmos for move, rotate, and scale. So for instance, mo the move gizmo, I just enabled it, will allow you to move objects using arrows like so. And I just undid that. And then there's another one equivalent for rotation. And I left the uh, move gizmo on there, so it still has the arrows on here, but it also added these rings in here now for rotating. This is ways of doing rotation and movement if for some reason you don't want to use the keys. I do this sometimes, even though I'm very familiar with the keys, I do this sometimes. 
when I want to very precisely position something and I'm not quite sure where I want it to be and I can kind of tweak it with these widgets. And then there's one for the scale also. And you can do the same thing with the scaling. And I didn't show you that shortcut key, but that's the S. And it works the same way as the rotate and move that you can scale things along specific axes like so. Suppose that you want to move instead, you, suppose you want to constrain the movement, but not along an axis. Rather, you want to constrain it to a plane. Um, like, uh, suppose we want to move this cube along the Z plane. Um, so we would tap G for movement and shift Z. That means move along the plane, the Z plane. That's what I'm doing right now. And the same thing goes for the rotate. Shift Z will make it rotate um, along the, the Z plane. And these are very powerful commands. Let me undo this rotate I did. And let's take these widgets off. Those rotations were respect to the global coordinates. Um, but suppose that you have an object that's already been rotated. Let's say, um, and you want to move something relative to its local, see its reference point has been rotated and you want to move something relative to its reference, local reference point rather than the global. You come up here to the middle drop down menu and change this to local. And then, um, if we had a, let's just add another cube in here. We add a cube in here. That's in this cube is in the local reference frame of the, um, of that object. Then when I tap the uh, Z axis, it moves it relative to, instead of the Z global Z axis, it moves it relative to the Z axis of the rotated object or the, the X and the Y. Undo that. Okay. So with that, that's the basic navigation around the viewport. Let's jump into the actual tutorial. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, create a a uh, an animated dice and by the time we're done within the next 20 minutes you're going to be able to run this through ray trace rendering that will be hard to distinguish it it to the non-expert eyes it will be difficult to tell whether it is a real photograph of an object um so you'll be ray tracing soon that's uh we're going to default we're going to delete the default cube and um we're going to add another cube. The reason I did that is because the default cube has some things already added to it. We don't want, we just want a pristine cube. So we deleted that right here at the center of the screen. You'll notice what looks like a red and white ring through which a, um, a small version of the X, Y, Z axis runs through it. This is called the 3d cursor where right now this cursor is at the origin of the world. Wherever this is located, when you add a new object to the uh, to the world, it'll appear. It the origin of that object will appear at this 3D cursor, and um, this is a very powerful. This 3D cursor is a very powerful way of controlling where things appear in the world, and we're going to use it quite a bit here in a in the next few minutes. So, um, right now I'm going to add a new cube. It's going to show up right there at that cursor. So shift A for add, mesh, and we're going to cube. Down here at the bottom left, um, when I when the cube appeared, there also appeared this menu down here that um, add cube, and I just expanded it. And this allows us to reparameterize the cube. So for instance, its size. We want something the size of a dice, which are 16 millimeters across. And so we're going to resize this to 0 0.016 meters. And it's now much smaller than it was before. It disappeared. We could zoom in on it to find it. But, you know, if the camera's not exactly centered on it, that can be a little tricky. The really fast way to find an object that's gone out of the field of view or that you can't find or it's behind something. First, up here in the upper right it, um, is the, um, the scene, the objects in the scene. It's a list of the objects in the scene. We're working with a cube. Select it. Bring your mouse arrow back into the viewport, and then tap on your on your number pad. Tap the tap the uh, period key. So number pad period, and that'll zoom in right on the object. There's our our cube right there. 
we're going to um right now we we rescaled it down and uh, we're going to reposition it so it's just above the xyz axis so i've got it selected g for move and then i'm going to tap the z so it's moving along the z axis and we're going to drag it up until it's just above the xyz axis and if you need to move something really finely you can hold down the shift key while you're dragging it with mouse like this. So I'm holding down shift right now and you can see now it's dragging much slower. This is for fine movement. Now we're gonna move this up to just above the XYZ axis. Right there should be good. And then we're going to, the scale I applied is in local coordinates, but we want this to be global, this cube to be, it, the mesh to actually be scaled to this size now. So we need to apply the scaling. We, with the object selected, we tap Control A and scale, apply scale. So this will apply it to the mesh. The mesh will now be this scale, will be this size. The scale has now been applied. Now we're going to assign a material so we get some colors on here. With the item selected, over here in the bottom right, this is the property browser you see. It's a little bit hidden somewhat behind my portrait here. On the, um, There's a whole bunch of different property items in this menu to the uh, left of it. Go to the se second from the bottom. This is material properties. There are no materials in this cube. We're going to click new. And uh, we're going to rename this to white. This is going to be a white material. We're going to ignore the first stuff here at the beginning. We'll look at that later. Um, and uh, I need to close this so we can we can see behind me. We want to go to a viewport display. Um, it's already a white color. I'm going to make it a little brighter. And we're going to decrease the roughness so it's a little shiny. You won't see much of a difference yet, but this will be important later on. Okay, we, so we just set the material. Uh, next thing we need to do is, right now this cube is literally just six squares glued together. And we can't do much with a square. There's just nothing to shape on it. So we need to subdivide the meshes to give us a finer um, amount of detail that we can work with. So. Right now, um, in the upper left, you'll see this object mode. This shows what mode our workspace is in. And there's a whole bunch of different modes, edit, sculpt, vertex, weight, paint, texture, paint. We want to go into edit mode. So you can either click on this and select edit, or you can click the tab, enter the tab key, which is what I just did. And um, it shows the vertices. We're now in the edit mode for this mesh. This is going to allow us to edit the mesh of the object that we have selected. Um, it's going to ignore all other objects in the scene. We'll, we'll still be able to see them unless we hide them by, by default. But um, here we'll be able to edit it. So it's got the uh, the vertices highlighted. We, we just right now, all we want to do is right click on it and we want to enter subdivide. And it's subdivided once each face. We want to subdivide it one more time so that we have six squares on each face. And that'll be good enough. We're gonna go back into object mode, so I entered tab to object. Next thing we're gonna do is we wanna bevel the edges. No real dice in the world has edges this sharp. It would probably be dangerous and it would probably make it less accurate, so we wanna bevel the edges. We're gonna add a modifier, a bevel modifier. So over here in the properties menu, uh, properties browser here on the right, um, we were in the materials property. We're going to go up uh, one, two, three, four, five to this wrench symbol right here. This is the uh, modifier properties for the object. If you click on this menu, you're going to see a humongous number of modifiers. Um, you don't need to worry about most of these. In this tutorial, we're only going to use three of these. We're going to use the array modifier, bevel, and boolean uh, modifiers, all conveniently right here at the top. Right now we're going to select the bevel. Um, it's uh, the default bevel is a little bit bigger than what we want. In fact, we need something much much smaller. But since this is a small dice, we need one a one millimeter bevel, 0 .001. Enter that in, 
And then um, it defaults to just one segment. We want to add segments to make it more curvy. So I'm going to increase this to six in segments. And that'll do it for now. So we have some, some curves on there. I'll show you later how to make these even smoother without having to add more vertices. So starting to look more like a dice now. What we need to add are our pips. But before we do that, we need to apply this bevel modifier. At the moment, it's a modifier that has not yet been applied to the mesh. So it's showing us what it will look like. But right now, as far as Blender's concerned, there's still just a cube underneath here. So we need to, and all the modifiers work like this. Until you apply them, they're not part of the mesh. So we need to go to this drop down arrow right here and, and click apply. So now it's part of the mesh. Let me let me do that again because I want to show you what happens if I don't apply this. If I go into the edit mode to see the mesh, it doesn't show, it shows the vertices from after we subdivided it, but without the bevel. So if we were to modify the mesh right now, it would be modified as if the bevel had not been applied, which might work, but it might not work. It can make funny things can happen. So let's go back into object mode. We're going to apply that uh, modifier. And then we're going to go back into edit and you're going to see what happened when I applied it. Now you see all these new vertices on here. It, it, it converted those bevels into actually, it actually modified the mesh for us. So that little apply does some really major things. Um, but it's perfect because this is what we want. We need that bevel applied before we start adding in the pips. Now, um, what we're going to do next is we're going to add the, the pips and you're probably wondering, well, how are we going to add pips? We got to like hollow out these holes in there and we got to color them. And this looks like it's going to be really complicated. Um, if that's what you're thinking, well, I'm about to, I'm about to astonish you with the power of blender. Um, so, but to do this, we're going to need the 3d cursor. We're going to need the Boolean and the array modifiers, both of them. And we're going to need to apply materials in a specific order. And um, it's going to probably be the first time you see this. It's going to probably be a little confusing. And you're going to be wondering, what the heck did he just do? But you'll end up using these so much going forward that it'll become second nature. And that's why I'm showing these to you. Because the se sequences I'm going through right now, you'll find yourself probably using this for all kinds of different different tasks. They're very powerful tools. That's why I'm including them in this tutorial. So with that said, remember, you can always go back in the video and rewatch this, this part. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the first face and we're going to put, we're going to assign one pip to it to be the one side of the dice. So I'm going to select the, I'm going to go into um, right now, the edit mode is in vertex view mode. So we see lots of dots. You can see up here in the top left, this blue highlighted box is the uh, selection mode and we're in vertex mode. There's also an edge mode and a face mode. And these allow you to edit, respectively edit vertices, edges, and faces. We want a, the face mode. You can also select these with um, hotkeys. So one, two, three for vertex, edge, and face. So we want face. Uh, we're gonna select the face that we want right here with the left mouse button. Then I'm gonna hold down Shift S, cursor to selected. That moves the 3D cursor to the very center of this face. The reason is because we're gonna add an object right now that's gonna help us create the pips. And it's gonna appear right where we want the pip to be at. So we have that selected in edit mode. The only reason we went into edit mode right now was to position the cursor. We wanted to position the cursor at the face where we want the pip. We're not actually going to edit the mesh. We just needed to position the cursor. So we're going back into object mode because we need to add the object. Cursor is where we want it. We're going to tap Shift A, Mesh, and Icosphere. This is for an icosahedron sphere that's been subdivided. Um, it defaults to a very large size. The pips we want need to be four millimeters in diameter. So we want to set the radius down here in the bottom left to 0 0.002 meters for a radius of two millimeters. Um, that makes that much smaller. Now, um, for the subdivision, if uh, you subdivide one, which is no subdivision, then what you have is an icosahedron, which is a, um, is a uh, platonic solid. And uh, as we subdivide, it adds more angles. 
more triangles to it and spherizes it. We're going to make it a subdivision of three. This is still a little coarse, but we're going to smooth this along with the cube later to make it even smoother. So this will be more than enough for what we need. So there, there's our pip. Um, we're going to go with that. We, we have now, believe it or not, even though this is a bump and we don't want to bump, we've, we've more or less finished adding the pip. You'll see in a little bit later why. Now we're going to do uh, the second side with two pips. And pay attention because this is where we're going to use the uh, ray modifier. We're going to go back into edit mode. We're going to add, we need to have two pips, one on the upper left corner and one on the bottom right corner. We're going to pick the upper left corner, shift S to position the cursor there. Go back in the object mode, shift A to add mesh. We're going to add another icosphere, icosphere. It defaults to the previous size we used, which is really convenient. We don't have to go back in here again and modify that. Now, we could go back into edit mode, select this face, reposition the cursor there, go back in the object mode, add another icosphere, and then we would have two pips. And that would work pretty good. But then we're going to have to do this three times for the three side and four times and so on. And it's going to be a lot of extra work. I'm going to show you a much faster way to do this using the array modifier. So let's delete that second pip. Instead, we're going to pick this first pip I added on here. We're going to go over here to the properties browser on the right, add modifier array. And then um, this is going to replicate the object that we're adding the modifier to. And it's going to replicate it along a grid that we specify here. The, um, the spacing is in units of the size of the object. And just for your benefit, I already figured out what number we need. We need 2.5 to get these positions. So we need to, um, up here in the upper right, is like which axes do we need to space these along? If, up here on the upper right, you'll see this uh, mapping of the axes where they, they're lined with. So even if you can't see these X, Y axis lines, and you usually can't see the Z line. You can see how they're oriented based on this widget up here. So if I drag this around, you can see that moving around. You can use that to figure what axes we need to modify. So we want to put we want to put this other pip down here in the bottom right. That means we need to go along the negative X axis and the negative Z axis. So we're going to come over here to the ray modifier, tap in negative 2.5 for the X and negative 2.5 for the Z. And that should position us exactly where we need to be okay and with that we've got side two done now we need to do size side three we're going to go back into edit mode we're going to pick our upper right face here position the cursor there go back into object mode add the icosphere and then we are going to do the array modifier again note our how our axes are oriented here since we're in 3d space and we're rotating around the die you can see how it you can quickly get disoriented and that's where blender's great is it's got these widgets on here for keeping track of how your orientation is so if you ever get lost and you can't figure out where the heck up is just take a look at that widget right there okay so we uh, we want to put three pips down the diagonal right here so that's going to be along the negative x direction and the negative y direction but it's going to be half the distance so it's going to be 1.25 we're going to go negative 1.25 and on the y we're going to do minus 1.25 now we need three so we need to come up to this count field and increment that by one and there we have three okay now we need to do the four side we're going to go back into edit mode. We're going to select the upper left face. I think I said upper right before when I was selecting upper left. I apologize for that. Upper left face. We're going to go back. We're going to position the cursor. Then go back into object mode. Add our icosphere. And then we're going to do another array. Um, and this one's going to be along the, the minus X direction. Now you're maybe wondering how we're going to put the second row in there because this doesn't seem to be like a square grid. Well, what we do is we just add one row and then we, there's nothing that stops us adding another modifier in here. We're just going to add another array modifier. This, the the, uh, the order of the modifiers in here, you can chain up a whole bunch of modifiers. And the way these work is that um, each modifier modifies 
the version of the mesh modified by the previous modifiers. So this second array modifier isn't going to modify the mesh itself. It's going to modify the mesh that's been modified by the first array modifier. So we're going to use this to replicate the, the first row. And you'll see that's already added that row, but the offset's not right. We need to go in the negative, we need to go in the positive Y direction, 2.5. And I need to set the X to zero. And there we go, four. Now we're going to do five. And that needs to be opposite two. So we're going to go back into edit mode, select the upper left face, position the cursor, go back in the object mode, add the icosphere. And uh, we need to add four pips like we just did for four. And then we're going to add in another one right in the middle separately from those. So we're going to do the exact same thing we just did with the array. So we need to go in the negative X and the positive Z direction. And Z equals... Oh, my apologies. We need that to be zero because we're adding in the second array. Correction. Yes, we're adding in the second array. That one's going to be along the Z direction, so 0 and 2.5. So we have 4. Then we're going to go back into edit mode, select the center face, object mode, and then we're going to add an icosphere right there in the center. Oh, you know what I did? I forgot to add, move the cursor, which is the entire reason I wanted to edit mode in the first place. Cursor to selection and then back in object mode. And this is how we learn. Um, I've been using Blender now for a while and I still make mistakes regularly. So control Z is your friend and uh, muscle memory is learned through, through error. So, um, so we got five pips. We just have the last one to do, which is the six side. Edit mode, upper left, move the cursor, back in object mode. Add our icosphere. We're going to add an array. This is going to be another two. We're going across positive Y. And then we're going to add another array modifier. And uh, I'm sure you can guess that we're going to need to add three rows this time instead of two. And the spacing is going to be closer. This is going to be along the positive Z direction. 1.25. And we're going to increment that to three. And we have our pips. It's starting to look like a real life dice. Of course, you know, these are uh, need to be indents, but we're getting to that. We'll get to that very shortly. Um, first thing we need to do is we want to treat these pips as if they were one mesh. Right now, they are seven meshes. Um, so... We need to join these together. Before we can join them, though, we need to apply the array modifiers. Right now, they haven't been applied. So each of the pips, starting with pip 2, we started adding arrays. We need to go to these and apply them. You could have done this when we added them in there, but I didn't want to over... I wanted to minimize the number of steps we were doing at the time. So we'll apply 3, go to 4... We're going to have two to apply here. Make sure that you apply the top one first because um, otherwise it'll ignore the other one. Then we'll go to five and six. And there's a quicker way to do all these at once, but um, I'm doing it the slower way to for your guys' education. Now we have those all applied. Now we need to select all the pips. Um, we could go and shift select each one, but the faster way to do that is just to select everything. We can draw a box around it and then shift click the cube to deselect it. And you have to do it twice. And that has all of them selected. And um, right now they're all kind of a dark red color. Let me do this again because this is important. So if I select them all, you'll notice that most of them are dark red, and then one is a orange outline, the, the cube. That means that of this group of items that have been selected, the, one of them is designated for operations, and that is the light orange one. If we shift-click on it, it deselected it. Now, all the objects selected 
they're they're all selected, but none of them are designated as the um, the one to be operated on. And we want to join all of them together, but they have to be joined to something. So we need to select which one we want to join them to. And that um, I'm going to just pick this one pip right here. I'm going to shift click on it once, and that'll change its color from dark red to to orange outline. And that means it's the designated item to be joined to. And then we're going to we're gonna we're gonna enter Control J, or you can right click on it for join. And they didn't move, but they're now all one mesh. If I move these, they all move together. They're all together. Um, so we're going to assign a material now, and we want these to be black. So I'm back over here in the properties browser, material. We're going to add a new material, call it black. Go to viewport display, and we're going to make this black, and we're going to make it sh make them shiny. All right, so starting to look like black pips there. Okay. Now we're going to, I'm going to show you how to make these pips into divots. And we're going to use the Boolean operator. For the Boolean operator, we also needed the pips to be one, one joined together as one mesh. So we're going to select the, um, the cube, go to the modifiers and add the Boolean modifier. Let me explain real quick what the Boolean modifier is. The Boolean uh, modifier is meant to operate between two meshes. And what it does is it, it combines them. And there's different ways you can combine them. For instance, you can do a union Boolean operator. And that will That's really the equivalent of just, if we were to join two objects together, like with the control J, that would be the equivalent of doing the union. You just join them together. But um, you can also do a difference operator and that's what we're going to do right now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to have the we're going to essentially we're going to subtract the pips from the cube we're going to and it's going to wherever the the pips intersect the pip mesh of the pips intersect with the mesh of the cube wherever they intersect it's going to subtract that intersection from the cube in addition to that we're going to do it in a certain way that the Pips will leave behind their material on the on the cube so that we don't have to go in there and like manually paint them black. So let me show you this. So we got the cube selected. The Boolean modifier is added. Difference is the operation we want, and it's the default, um, and it's on an object. We need to select the object that it's going to operate on. So there's a, uh, a pipette right here we're going to pick that and go and select the object we want to do the difference on and that's going to be the pip and icosphere it's now selected here if um if we hide the pips using if we have the we're going to select the pips tap the h key and that'll make them it'll hide the pips and you'll see there's now divots in there they're white but there's divots so alt h will bring the pips back that just unhides them. They're still there. They just were hidden. So we need to go back in the modifier to get to get the material to leave behind. Down here in solver options, under materials, we want to change this from index-based to transfer. And now when we hide the pips, you'll see that their divots they left behind have been colored by the material of the pips rather than the cube. Okay, so... We're not quite done though yet because we need to apply the modifier. As of right now, the mesh has not yet been modified. So we need to go to apply. And now if we remove the pips, we'll see that our dice has been completed and we can delete the pips. And there we go. Now it's a little coarse. So how do we make this look smoother? We could have added a lot more bevels and made the icospheres a lot more subdivided, but that, that adds a lot more vertices and it can really slow down the renders. Um, once you have enough detail to get the shapes that you want and all you're worried about is just the, the, uh, the shading being smooth, 
Well, all you need to do is literally smooth the shading and there's an operation for that. So select the cube and this is now one object. All the, the, the pips and everything are all one object. Select it, go up here to the top menu object and about half, two thirds of the way down, we're gonna pick sh shade auto smooth. And look what that did. That made it look a lot smoother. It's not actually modifying the mesh at all. All it's doing is modifying the shading of the colors that are being shown here in the in the viewport. So that looks a lot like a real dice. And look how quickly we did that. And even me talking through every little thing that I was doing, you know, I could have done this much faster. So even objects that look relatively, I mean, dice are not that complicated, but it's certainly not like a cube. This is a cube with a whole bunch of extra details added on. You can see how quickly this thing complex objects could be put together inside blender <laughs> okay so with that we have a die but we're not done because i want to show you some other features i want to show you how to render a scene how to construct a basic scene how to render it and how to animate it so if all you wanted to do was know how to make a die there you go we have a dice but if you want to know about how to render a scene this is a scene and animate it stick around for a few more minutes so we're gonna we're gonna configure our scene. We have our camera here. Um, we seem to be upside down though. I just noticed the see the camera right here. This symbol right here means pointing up, and I just looked at it. this. I was saying you know you can it's easy to get disoriented in here. So I looked at my uh, widget up here orientation saw that we're upside down. So let's go back right side up. There we are. Now you see Z is pointing up, and uh, the world's better. Okay, so we have a light object in here we don't need because we're going to use actual sunlight. We're going to delete that. Um, we're going to move the camera in closer. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to move our viewport into roughly the side that we want to look at about right here. And then we're going to tap, we're going to type in control alt number pad zero. And you'll see this box drawn around the dice right here. This is our our camera port has been moved to where we were we were we were located at. So if we zoom out and rotate around, we'll see the cameras now we're located where we were we were just at. And if you want to go back to the camera view, just tap zero, type zero on the number pad. It'll bring you back in. You can zoom in. If you want to, see, you can slave the um, you can tie the. Uh, the camera to the viewport if you want to position the camera more precisely so if you're in the camera view like this type n key and enter the view menu over here and go down to this right here camera to view this locks the camera to the view and then if you start rotating the camera around and panning around it'll move the camera with you and this is really useful if you're trying to position a a shot precisely just make sure that you uncheck it when you're done otherwise you'll accidentally drag your camera off where you you'll pos position your camera exactly the perfect place where you wanted it forget to check that box and then drag it off into the boonie somewhere and not realize it so make sure you uncheck this once you're done um, we have our camera positioned now we need some si sort of a surface under this so we're going to add in a plane underneath the dice to act like a table sort of um First thing we need to do though, remember that our cursor right here, wherever that's at, an object will be added. So we wanna, we can always add the plane, but it'll be positioned wrong and we'll have to move the plane. Instead, let's just move the, uh, move the cursor. Um, and we're gonna move the cursor to the origin right underneath the dice. And we can do that really easily by tapping Shift C. If your 3D cursor gets positioned in a weird place and you just can't find it, just tap Shift C. And that put the, uh, Put the cursor right back at the origin. Um, it also resets our view though, so we have to zoom back in. Now we're gonna add in our plane, Shift A, Mesh, Plane. And we're gonna make this a little smaller. We're gonna set it to one meter instead of two meters. Let's go into materials and give it a material. Um, we're gonna make this uh, a dark gray and only slight, slightly shiny and there we have our dice and the last thing we can do is set up our lighting because we just deleted our camera so we're going to go over here to our properties browser let's close this 
menu in, and then we're gonna go into our properties browser, and there's a world properties. Select this, and go to color. There's dot right here, Push on, press on this yellow dot right next to color. We're gonna select the texture. This is for the, wor the world around us. We're gonna select sky texture. Um, this simulates sunlight. We're going to turn down just a little bit because it's really bright. We'll set the elevation and rotation um, a, a little later, but for right now we'll leave it there. And with that, let's see, let's um, set our render properties. So we're going to use the EV renderer first. That's not the ray tracer. Um, I want to show you the, the EV renderer first. So go to the uh, output properties. We're gonna set the resolutions to a square view, 1200 by 1200 pixels. You can do whatever you want. That's just what I'm picking. I'm gonna set the frame rate to 30. We're gonna need that a little later. Um, frame range. Output directory, while we're here, we're, let's change this before we forget. Um, the renders get stored by default to the local temporary directory, which is really annoying. I wish it would store it to like wherever the files save that. So let's change that to an appropriate output directory. Um, yep, that'll work. And we'll leave the rest of it like that for now. And with that, we're ready to render. As I said, we're gonna render first with the EV renderer. So EV is a procedural renderer. Uh, what is a procedural renderer? It's what most people are familiar with when they think of 3D graphics in games. That's procedural rendering. Um, most games are not, we don't typically use like physics-based rendering in games and other real-time graphics because it's too slow. Like ray tracing, that's a physics-based rendering. That's changing now with new technologies, but by and large, we still stick mostly to it. Um, Blender has a procedural renderer for real-time rendering called EV. It's very powerful. It's like it can do some pretty sophisticated stuff, even for a procedural renderer. Um, even so, even so, you're going to see later on as we get to the ray tracing that it just it it'll look pretty good, but it just won't hold the candle to the to the ray tracing. But we'll start with the EV because it's fast. So we have EV selected right here, and uh, we're gonna underneath. EV, we're going to turn on ambient occlusion, bloom, and screen space reflections. These are adding on additional um, rendering capabilities, so it makes it look more realistic. Um, makes it run a little slower, but it makes it more realistic. And uh, we're now ready to render it. We just type the key F12, and it'll render it. But something's not quite right. We see our die, but everything's white well you'll remember when we were setting our materials that i was setting the colors for the viewport display i skipped over the section where we set the colors for the render so we need to go into the shading and set our material properties let's let's do that right now um, we need to go to a different workspace right now we're in the layout workspace up on the top here you'll see tabs for all the different possible workspaces we're going to switch over to this one called shading and that's going to show our scene here. Um, it defaults to this scene that has a default world background image. Um, we want to go into the render render uh, shading mode. So here in the top right, select the these four spheres right here. We want to. We were just in we, this whole time. We'd been in this this solid shading mode. We want to go to the one on the far right, which is the rendered viewport. And we're going to zoom in on our scene. Everything's white. It's hard to see. There's our dice. Okay. So we're going to select our dice. Actually, first, let's select our plane. We're going to set the material on our plane first. So um, normally we would work with our colors down here in the bottom. But um, that's a more advanced topic. I don't want to get to that in this, this tutorial. We're going to continue working with the properties on the right. And that's all we need for this. So come over here to the properties browser on the right. Go to the material properties where we were at earlier. You'll see we have the table material selected. We're going to set it to very dark gray. And I want to make this a metal metallic surface. So we're going to come down here to metallic. And we're going to drag this all the way to the right. 
to one. We're going to turn down the specular ref reflections to make it a little easier on the eyes, reduce the glare. And uh, we're going to, we're going to turn down roughness just a little bit, just so we just get just a, just a tiny bit of reflection off of there. Okay. And with that, that's our tabletop. Now we're going to select our dice. Now, if you look on the dice here, you'll see that it has two materials applied to it, white and black. That's because some of its vertices have been colored black by the uh, pips that were transferred over. So we need to modify both of these. We're going to start with the white. Um, we're going to... These are already white, but they're not bright white. We're going to make them just slightly brighter. We're going to set the subsurface to 0 0.001. I'm not going to explain what this is right now. Other than just say that the subsurface, this will make it just look a little bit more like plastic instead of um, of like white paint. And subsurface color, the same thing. And then we're going to non-metallic and we're going to turn the roughness way down so it's nice and shiny. Okay, and then while we still have the die selected, we're going to pick the black material. We're going to set it to black. And you'll see the pips are now black. Um, we're actually not going to set the subsurface. We don't need that. They're so small. It won't make a difference. And we'll turn the roughness way down on that. So now we'll, uh, you'll see that we've got uh, that this dice is looking ever more realistic. There's a little bit of ghosting there as I scroll around because the rendering is much higher uh, definition now. Um, but with that, we are ready to render this. So F12, there's our EV render. We are zoomed way out though. So let me zoom this in. Let's go back to the layout. We're done with shading now. We don't need to be in this workspace anymore. So we can go to shading. Let's go to our camera. Um, I must have inadvert inadvertently moved the camera. So let's zoom this in. Right there. Let's try that again. F12. There we go. So that's in closer. Now let's, uh, it's a nice looking night, but let's do something more interesting with it. Let's uh, tilt it on its corner. So we're going to rotate it along the, uh, let's see, the X axis by 45 degrees. And then we're going to rotate it around the Y axis by 35 degrees. This will happen to put it so that the opposite corners are above e and below each other as if we were spinning the spinning the dice then we're going to raise this along the z axis until it's just barely kissing the surface oh and by the way another tip if um if you're if you're moving an object and you want it to follow an axis but you don't want to type in the key you can just click the middle mouse button and it'll it'll um latch to whatever axis is the closest so i just tap middle key and since i'm moving mostly along the z-axis it uh it grabbed it along the x-axis so middle key and i okay let's look underneath here and see how close we've got that so we're just underneath let's go up a little bit higher i'm gonna hold down shift to get finer and i want to have it just barely touching it i think right there is good And uh, let's see. I have been dragging the camera around. Remember how I said not to drag it around? Or be careful by dragging around? Well, yeah, I was just doing it. But I noticed it too. Okay, so let's render that now and see what we got. Okay, it's a little more interesting. Let's maybe uh, maybe drag it, uh, drag the camera over. Whoop. Let's go back to the camera and let's oriented more maybe let's see if we can get a cross section right there good okay now we can put the viewport also in render mode here let's see if we can position the um, the lighting in a more interesting fashion so we'll go back the camera's positioned i got the viewport into rendered mode we're going to go back to the world properties over here on the right and we're going to tweak the uh, sun settings here to see if we can.
maybe get the sun kind of behind us a little bit. Higher elevation. F12. Okay. So it's looking pretty good. Now let's try out the cycles. Cycles render. Um, first, I'm going to rotate this slightly along the Z axis so we can get a better, slightly better view. What do you think? And uh, okay, we're going to use the uh, ray tracer. So let's go back to the render settings here and right here by render engine in this drop down menu, we're going to pick cycles. And then very important, you have a GPU. Then on device, set the GPU computer. And we're going to change some of these default settings because they are way too aggressive. Um, so down here, the default render settings are set way too high. We're going to set the noise threshold to 0.1. And we're only going to set max samples to 64. That'll be enough for it to look really nice. Um, I mean, it's not always the case, but for this particular scene we're doing, um, th this is actually a really good setting. So it's already doing a preview of the rendering. It's already looking pretty good, but let's do a F12 here to get a, a full tracing render. And this will take 30 seconds. So we can see it's sampling around. It's uh, very speckly sampling the, uh, the physics based model. But once it finishes sampling, it will do a denoising step and, and clear. So we're halfway there, but it accelerates as it's close finishing. So we're already up to, yeah, it's in uh, denoising right now. I'll give it a second. So take a look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It looks like a uh, real die miraculously sitting on its corner, resting on a somewhat shiny tabletop in sunlight um and we can we can play around with the um let's play around with the camera a little bit there's a lot of glare in this so you can't see the reflection so that's where the uh the viewport preview is really nice right here is we can kind of adjust the camera lighting yeah we had the sunlight coming like right in our eyes so i didn't put that in a very good position let's drag this around maybe be about right there so we got the shadow just barely visible over here. We have a cool reflection coming down here. Um, and let's try and render that. We had some really strong ocular reflections coming off the uh, surface there. We didn't do a very good job at that, but for, for double checking our positionings. Noising. Beautiful. Look at that. I mean, doesn't that look almost photorealistic? At least it does to me. Um, I mean, you get the reflection. If anything, it's too perfect. And in a, in a future tutorial or other tutorials on on here on that you can find on YouTube, you'll be able to find tutorials on how to make the surface look rougher and more realistic. Um, and I could do that right now, but I don't want to, I've already dumped so much detail on you guys. We'll, we'll leave it here for right now. Just glory in the absolute perfection of this particular die. That's way more perfect than we'll ever see in the real world. But to the uneducated eye, a person's going to have a hard time telling whether this is for real or not. So now if all you wanted to do was be able to do ray tracing, and render a die, you've done it. I'm going to show you now how to animate it. So stay with me a few more minutes if you want to see how to animate this. We're going to go back. And before we do that, though, you can save this image. Right now, it's it's based inside 
Blender, but if you go over here to, in this render view right here, if you go up to the image, you can save as wherever you want to save it and name the file, whatever you want. It defaults to PNG files. And uh, you can just go dice sample PNG, just saved it. All right, so let's go back and let's animate this thing. This won't take very long. So what we're going to do is, I don't know if you ever did this when you were a kid, but you can turn a die, you can turn dice into a top by spinning them on their on their corner. Um, I have a video here of me doing it earlier today with the dice to show you what I mean. So I'm going to simulate a uh, spinning dice here. It's going to be really simple. We already have it on its corner. We just need to spin it around its Z-axis. However, to do it, we need to use Blender's very powerful animation capabilities. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. Down here in the bottom of the workspace, you probably maybe noticed this earlier, what looks like a timeline. That's exactly what this is. This is a timeline for animation. Right now, we are on frame one. We're going to tell uh, Blender that this is the position of this dice at frame one. Select the dice. We're going to enter I on the keyboard, which is the insert keyframe menu. And keyframes are key positions of objects during the uh, animation. And we're going to select location and rotation. We're telling it it's location and rotation at frame one. And you'll see down here in the timeline, this yellow diamond appeared. That means there's a keyframe recorded there. Next, we're going to advance the frame to, to frame two. And you can either do that with dragging the mouse or just use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Right arrow will advance it by two. Left arrow will go back one. We're going to advance it two. We're going to make sure our dice are selected. And we're going to rotate it along the Z-axis by 168 degrees. Enter. And we're going to enter that as a keyframe, location, rotation. We see a new keyframe. And I'm going to do this 15 times. The reason why I'm doing 168 degrees is because over 15 frames, that divides exactly into an integer number of rotations. Why am I doing it like that? I could much, and you can do it this way if you want. You can do like 90 degree rotations, and then you only have to record four frames to get a complete rotation that you can repeat but the human eye is really good at picking up patterns and when you do 90 degree rotations in only like four frames it just doesn't look like it's really rotating that much so doing the 168 means it takes a lot more rotation more frames before you get a repeat of the same frames and it looks more realistic so um, I do have to put in 15 keyframes, but it actually doesn't take that long. I mean, I already have two, and I'm talking here, blabbing along. So let me add in those other ones real quick. So we're going to advance to uh, frame three. And here we have the last 168 degree rotation and we are back at the start. Now we, we're going to actually record 30 ren rendered frames, but because it's going to repeat the rotations, all we need to do is tell Blender to repeat these keyframes. So let's, let's run, run this animation. We'll, we'll slide back the timeline to one and let's, Let's play it. We'll click the play button over here or press the space bar, which will play it also. And it'll rotate it and then it'll stop. And then it'll repeat back into uh, shade mode. So you can see it's only rotating during the first half of the animation. We need to tell Blender to repeat the animation after it finishes it. So let's stop and we'll go back to the beginning. Put, place your mouse arrow over the timeline. It's important that it's over the timeline. And then tap Shift E. And this brings up the extrapolation menu. We're going to tell it, extrapolate means what does it do after it finishes what it was told to do. More, right now, it's got an empty extrapolation. We're going to tell it to do a cyclic extrapolation. That means repeat it. Now, when we play it, we'll see it just rotates 
forever. That's what we want. And with that, we are ready to render this. That's our animation. It's it's done. So let's do an EV animation because uh, it'll take a long time to do this. And it'll take about 15 minutes on my laptop to render this in cycles. But I can show you how to do this on uh, EV. So I switch to EV. Let's go to the output. Um, we're going to render at 30 frames per second. So we got a one second render here. And to uh, when you tap F12, that'll render whatever frame you're at at the moment. To render the entire animation, you do Control F12. And this will take about 20 to 30 seconds. You can see it's going through it pretty quick. We're on frame 10. What this is doing is it's rendering it and saving each root frame as a PNG. And then um, I'll show you what it looks like after it's done, and then I'll show you how to convert it into a uh, MPEG file format, encode it. But uh, we can also play the PNGs. Frame 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay, so you don't have to render the video, though, to watch it as a video. It, if you tap Control F11, it'll pull, it'll assemble it that it'll assemble the rendered frames into a uh, animation and play it for you. So control F11. There we go. Um, that looks like a rotating die. Let's close that. And now we're going to encode that into an MPEG file. Well, actually, before we do that, I want to show you how to make it look even more realistic. We're going to add motion blur. So we're going to go into the render properties and right here, you'll see motion blur down here. Expand that. We're going to switch this to 100 millisecond shutter speed. And it's important that you set steps to something greater than one because uh, this just tells it to look at adjacent frames to do the uh, motion blur properly. I'm going to set this to 20. If we uh, look at just one frame right now, I tapped F12. You can see uh, we're getting already getting some motion blur in there, but we want to animate this. Let's do Control F12 again. 30. Let's animate it. Okay, and I think that looks a lot more realistic. So let's close this. And let me show you how to encode this as an MPEG. Come up here to the upper right. Uh, we need a different workspace. Up, up. Per, um, the workspace menu up here at the top. Click on the plus button right here. We we'll go down to video editing, and we're going to add in a video editing workspace. Um, and if you've used video editors before, um, like Lightworks, it, this should look pretty familiar. This time strip down here, we're going to go to add image sequence. Go to your output directory where you told it to store output. And you'll see all these PNGs, which are our rendered frames. Tap the A key. That'll select all of them. Add image strip. Make sure that it's dragged all the way to the start. Zero seconds here at frame one. Otherwise, you'll get a dark gap at the beginning. Then we're going to go to the top right here in the for output format. And this is really important. You need to change file format from PNG to FFmpeg video. And now just tap control F12 again, but it's not going to render all the frames. It's just going to, the frames already exist. It's going to assemble them all into, it's done. See, it already encoded them. And if we go to our output directory, um, we'll see the uh, rendered video right here with the MKV extension. That's its default MPEG file extension. Um, in Windows, we need to tell it to loop the video if we want us to see it keep spinning because we only have one second video here. But there you go. That's with EV. With Cycles, it'll look even more realistic. So with that, you've seen the entire um, workflow for for generating a uh, uh, anim anim computer graphics animation in Blender. I hope this was... Uh, Super helpful. Um, I'm going to have some future tutorials going forward covering more advanced uh, topics. 
And if you watch this and you've got questions or requests for future content, please leave comments. I read comments and I will try to answer them as best as I can. I'm really glad that you found this. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please press the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, you help me, but you also help other people looking for content by recommending the material. The YouTube algorithms know than to uh, recommend it to other people. So thank you again. And uh, this is Joseph Palmer, the autodidact, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Bye.